Father, we thank you because we know you have answered our prayers. We have prayed here and all over where the workers meeting is going on now, we have all prayed. And Lord, we pray that you'll say amen and yes with assurance to every prayer we have prayed in Jesus' name. We're asking the Lord you back them up. The power of heaven will never leave them. The grace of God will multiply in their lives. Brighter vision you'll give to them for your work in Jesus' name. Make them stronger. Make them mightier in the word of God. And make them, Lord, sustained in the grace of God that will move them from place to place. And this work will continue to expand in their lives, in their hands, in Jesus' name. Strengthen us too. And I pray, Lord, tonight you speak to every heart. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Now, you know, the other locations, they are saying amen, but I cannot hear their amen. Heaven is hearing their amen. Help them and say the amen of all the other locations. Amen. The Lord bless you today and this month and this year. And this year will be the best year you have ever lived in your life. God bless you. You can see now we're coming to Hebrews chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse different kinds of miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. That's the passage we're looking at tonight. The writer of the epistle to the Hebrews emphasized the fact that this was not the first time the people were hearing. And it says, we ought to give heed to the things we have heard. We need to give earnest heed to the things we have heard. We need to give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. It's so easy to hear and allow it to slip away from us. It's so easy to hear and forget. It's so easy to hear and not think about it. It's so easy to hear and ignore. It's so easy to hear and we're not calculating, we're not planning, we're not building our lives on what we have heard. And so he said, we must, we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard and not allow them, he's talking quite about a lot of things here, the things we have heard. As you have been in the church, in this deep alive Bible church for such a long time, and you begin to recollect what have I heard? The things you have heard, lest at any time. You see, it's not just at the church here when we're in the meeting, at any time. And times come in our lives, maybe times of adversity. And may be times of prosperity. It may be time of getting married. It may be time of having children. It may be time we're celebrating something. It may be time of achievement at any time. That's the time we need to recollect the words we have heard. That's the time we need to bring in the word we have heard. Lest at any time we should let them sleep. And then it says, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, it said, how shall we escape? 
if we neglect, if we ignore, if we let it just lie fallow, if we just overlook it, we're not rejecting it, we're not contradicting it, we're not saying it's not true, we're not saying we don't believe it, we just neglect it, we just ignore it. And it says, how shall we escape? If we neglect, if we reject, if we ignore, so great salvation, great salvation, plunged by the great God of heaven, great salvation, but chased by the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ, great salvation revealed to us by the great sevenfold spirit of God, great salvation that is great enough to lift us from earth and take us to heaven, great salvation that is able to remove the greatest of mountains in our lives, the great sin in our lives, great salvation that is able to set us free from the power, the greatest power of Satan, of the enemy. How shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which had the force began to be spoken of by the Lord. It's saying that the salvation we're talking about is not a new kind of salvation. It's not a new generation of salvation. It's the same salvation that Jesus Christ spoke about and the same salvation that Jesus Christ provided for us. So great salvation, which at the first uh, was spoken in, uh, by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. This is the same salvation the apostles uh, got from Christ and then they presented to us. This is the same salvation that all the ministers in the New Testament church and then first century and second century until this time, Emma, the same salvation that uh, Martin Luther preached, the same salvation that Joe Wesley preached, the same salvation that all the great uh, servants of God from that time till this time, what they have revealed unto us. How shall we escape if we neglect that and not only that God also confirming, bearing them witness, both were signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and the gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. We will not neglect. I will not neglect. I will not reject. I will not ignore. I'm talking to you tonight on the divinely revealed way of escape from eternal judgment. The divinely revealed way of escape from eternal judgment. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the incomparable gateway to the final escape. There's going to be a kind of judgment. There's going to be eternal judgment at the end of the life of everyone that comes to this world. And there is a gateway. We pass through that gateway and we escape that final judgment. The incomparable gateway. There's no other gateway like this. There's no other comparable gateway. There is no alternative. This is the way. The incomparable gateway to the final escape. Number two, the irreplaceable good way to the future escape. The, the, the escape we're talking about is not just escape for now. It's escape in the future. When that future time will arrive and when the day of judgment shall arrive, that escape at the future time, there is this good way, the only way that we can take so that we'll escape. And it is irreplaceable. A new generation cannot come and say, well, that one, that way is for the old generation. And that one is for our fathers and grandfathers. And that one is for, you know, people who have gone. We're discovering now a new way. We're discovering something totally different, you know. This way is the good way and it is irreplaceable if we're going to have the future escape. Point number three, the incorruptible gospel way. What way are we talking about? It is the way that the gospel has outlined for us. And the gospel says this is the way. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming to the Father except by me. The incorruptible gospel way for a full escape. Full escape. You escape judgment finally. You escape judgment now. 
you escape the consequences of sin today and you escape the condemnation, damnation of sin in the future. Total, complete, entire, full escape. The incorruptible gospel way for a full escape. I come to number one, the incomparable gateway to the final escape. That's what he's saying. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 3. How shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which had the force began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. And as uh, we talk about escape, this escape from judgment did not start uh, even in the New Testament. If you go back to Genesis chapter, chapter 19, Genesis chapter 19, you will see. And that's why the passage says the people that neglected or the people People that refused the word spoken by angels, they paid dearly for that. Look at Genesis chapter 19, and I'm reading from verse 12. Genesis 19, verse 12. And the man said unto Lot, Actually, these are the angels, but uh, Lot foresaw them as men. And the, men, the angels said unto Lot, As thou hear any besides, son in law, and, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Judgment coming upon them. Devastation, destruction coming upon them, condemnation of fire with fire here on earth and they all through eternity coming upon them. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons in law, a which a marriage is a daughter's, and said, Ah, oh, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. It's not a decision by angels, it's by the Lord. The Lord sent those angels, and Lord got the message. And Lord understood the message. The Lord will destroy the city. But it seemed as one that mocked unto his sons in law. They neglected the message. How shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, and when the morning arose, then the angels, you see, the people that are referred to as a man in verse 12, they are now, we now know them and see them as angels. And when the morning arose, the, then the angels asked in Lord, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. It's talking about escaping judgment, escaping the consequence of the iniquity of the people. And while he lingered, people can linger. I've heard, I think about it. I've heard, I will pray about it. I've heard, one day, one day I will decide. I have heard, and they are lingering. And people can get into the judgment by just lingering. Not by outright unbelief or by outright rejection, but by just lingering. It says, while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord be merciful unto him. Salvation is by the mercy of God. Salvation is by grace. And this was the grace manifested to Lord, the wife, and the two daughters. And he brought them forth and set him without the city. Look at what he said. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth that he said, Escape for thy life. Look at the mercy of God and yet understand uh, there are two sides to the escape. One, the mercy of God. Two, your own decision, your own response, and your own taking heed so that you will not be lost. You know, there are people that have the idea if he wants to save me, he will save me. 
Jesus Christ is merciful and Jesus Christ is great. He died for me on the cross of Calvary. I don't have to do anything. You know? And there are people that say their gospel is the gospel of done. It's done. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to repent. You don't have to believe. You don't have to escape. You can linger. You can swim in sin and you can dive into sin. You can commit as many sins as you want to commit. It doesn't matter at all because it is done. No, it's done, but you have to do something. That's why it says over here that Lord and his wife and the two daughters, they had responsibility, something they must do. It came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stayed thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest thou be consumed. You can see, be consumed. Even with all the mercy that the Lord has shown, if you don't do your part, well, while they were going, look at verse 26. Verse 26, but his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. She didn't fully escape. Thank God I will escape. Look at Jude. Referring to what we have just read now in Genesis, Jude chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 7. Jude chapter 1, we're reading from verse 7. It says in verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh, as such forth for an example of suffering the vengeance of what kind of fire? Eternal fire. They didn't escape all those people in Sodom. That's what the Lord is telling us now that we have something to do and you need to do it urgently. And you need to keep to what you've done, your decision, so that you will escape that final judgment. I'm reading from Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11 the incomparable gateway to the final escape. Job chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 13, If thou prepare thine heart, and stretch forth thine hands toward him, if iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away, and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles, for then thou shalt lift up thy face without spot. Then thou shalt be steadfast and shall not fear. It says, if there's any iniquity in our hands, whether you claim to be saved or not, that's, that's not the problem now. Whether you say, I've been in the church for a long time, that's not the problem now. If iniquity be in thine hand, I come to church every time. If iniquity be in thy hand, I'm even a worker. If iniquity be in thine hand, the Lord is not looking at your church denomination. It's not looking at your area of service. It's not looking at the title you claim. It's it's not looking at any other scene, but if iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away from thee. Let not iniquity, let not sin, let not wickedness dwell in your tabernacle. Look at verse 20, verse 20. But the eyes of the wicked shall fail, and they shall not escape. Anyone claiming a great title, anyone claiming a great ministry, anyone claiming a great a privilege, and yet if there's wickedness or sin or it's iniquity, it says they shall not escape, and their hope shall be as the giving up of the ghost. Thank God you escape. Thank God we escape. I had only the amen of those who are escaping. I'm looking at Ezekiel chapter 17. Ezekiel chapter 17 is the gateway of repentance. 
and his great way of turning from everything that is wicked, everything that is evil, and then the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus here comes and he cleanses your heart and he washes your life and he makes you presentable before the throne of the Almighty God. Ezekiel chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 18. Ezekiel chapter 17, reading from verse 18. Seeing he despised the oath by breaking the covenant, when lo, he had given his hand and has done all these things, he shall not escape. You see, there are people, they base eternal salvation on the decision of a moment. I raised up my hand. I gave my life to the Lord. I said yes to the Lord. And I temporarily, at that time, repented. And I asked him to come to my heart. A decision of a moment. And I think now, after that decision, you could do whatever you want to do. You could break that covenant. You could forget your commitment to the Lord. You could forget the work of grace that the Lord has done in your heart. And just go on living merrily and in the world, in all the sins of the world. You break the covenant. It says they shall not escape. The way of escape is to make sure that we have come through the gate and we're walking in the way that leads to life everlasting. Verse 18 again, see, he despised the oath by breaking the covenant. When, lo, he had given his hand. He has given his hand to the Lord. He has given his heart to the Lord. He said, yes, Lord, I belong to you. You are mine and I'm yours. And then after that, and have done all these things, they shall not escape. Verse 19, therefore, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely my oath that he has despised and my covenant that he has broken, even each I will recompense upon his own head. It's telling us, uh, you know, there is a way we ought to walk. That's why we're told in, in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 25. Hebrews chapter 12. We're reading from verse 25. In verse 25 it says, See that he refuses not him that speaketh. That he is, he's still speaking. He didn't only speak at the time you were born again, at the time you were converted. He's still speaking today. And he's saying, this is the way, what keep therein. This is my word, get up and obey my word. And this is my will, do my will, fulfill my will. See that she refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not, who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape. We shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. You see that and there are some people that read their Bibles upside down. They say they go to seminary. They say they, they learn theology. And they say that they have this perspective and they have this uh, kind of uh, learning in their lives. They say, they say, you know, the Old Testament was the time when they had to do this. They had to be righteous and they had to be free from this and free from that. And if they didn't do that, judgment will come upon them. But they say, you know what? We're now in the New Covenant and we're in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, once you have given your life to the Lord, that's Lord, that's final. Anything you do after that doesn't really matter. They say that even if you go into sin, because everybody, according to them, will keep on sinning, they say it does not matter at all. God looks at them through Jesus Christ. And then he has forgiven the sins you have committed and the sins you are committing, and the sins you will ever commit. They say past, present, and future, all the sins are forgiven. You have the license to keep on sinning. He has given you the license before you even commit the sin. They think they are magnifying the grace of God. But look at this, look at this. See that he refused not. New Testament believers, see that he refused not him 
that speaketh, speaketh, is still speaking today, and is still saying, this is my word, this is my will, and this is what you need to do. For if they escaped not in the past, who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we in the New Testament, shall not we escape if we in the New Testament turn away from uh, him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has a promise saying, uh, yet once more I, will, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things uh, that are shaking, as of the things that are made, that those uh, things which cannot be shaken uh, may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom, it says, as we want to have that final escape, therefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace. Grace is available today. Grace to help, grace to strengthen, and grace to make you the man, the woman, the believer, the minister you ought to be. It says, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence. And tell me there. Godly fear. Verse 29, everybody, one, two, three, go. Read that again. That verb there, is it present or past tense? Tell me, tell me. Present tense. The people who say the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. And the Old Testament God was a God of wrath, indignation, judgment. He hated sin. But you know, the New Testament God, according to them, is an indulgent God, indulgent Father. You can see him even before, under his nose, right in his sight, he just smiles and he says, in any case, you are forgiven forever. Not at all, not at all. The God of the New Testament is him going to say, I'm God, I change not. I am God, I change not. And this tells us, for our God is a consuming fire. And I pray that fire will not consume us. We're coming to Matthew chapter 7, and I'm reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 7, we're reading from verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. This is the gateway to enter into the kingdom. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. And many there be that go in there, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. I pray you'll be among the few in Jesus' name. Jeremiah chapter 48, I'm reading from verse 19. Jeremiah chapter 48, we're reading from verse 19. O inhabitant of Aroa, stand by the way, espy, see, look, gaze, investigate, ask him the fleas and her that escapes and say what is done. Ask him the fleas, ask her that escaped, what have you done to escape? What have you done to escape the judgment, the devastation? And so he says, don't just uh, cough it out from yourself. Don't just think it out. I think to escape, I think this is what I'll do. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. Ask others that have escaped. The people that fled from the judgment of God. You can ask Isaiah, he'll tell you. Ask Jeremiah, he'll tell you. Ask Ezekiel, he'll tell you. 
ask them, ask Paul, he'll tell you, ask Peter, he'll tell you, you can ask John, he'll tell you. The people that fled from the judgment of God and they received the mercy of God and they're now in the kingdom, they were in the kingdom here evangelical kingdom and then they are now in the kingdom over there everlasting eternal kingdom ask them what did they do how did they escape that brings me to point number two the irreplaceable good way to the future ex escape irreplaceable there is no other there's no alternative this is the way and i pray that you are walking this way in jesus name we're looking at Jeremiah chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Thus says the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest, not just for your body, for your souls. Ye shall find rest for your souls. What's Isaiah telling us about the way you want to escape? You want to get out of that judgment? You want eternal judgment to escape you and to uh, get over you so that you will not perish forever? Isaiah chapter 53. I'm reading from verse 6. Isaiah chapter 53. We're reading from verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all souls. That's what I say. It's telling us. It says the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world is coming. And when he comes uh, through his chastisement to have peace, and then by his stripes, our soul, our mind, our body, our spirit will be healed. And he says, because God has laid on him the iniquity of all souls, he was oppressed. And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, and so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken he bought the pain he bought the uh, judgment he bought the chastisement and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence neither was any deceit in his mouth yet it pleased the lord to bruise him he has put him to grieve when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days. He's talking about his death and now he talks about his resurrection. He shall proclaim, he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That's the way, that's the good way. Isaiah tells us, he says, that's the lamb. And is the final sacrifice, is the full sacrifice. He has totally fulfilled the demands of God's righteousness. And so you can go to Him and have all your sins laid upon Him. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, Cannot I do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to pluck it up and to pull it down and to destroy it, if that nation or that kingdom of that family, of that individual, anyone against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil. I will repent of the evil that I sought to do unto them. 
that's the way, that's the way. We turn from the evil. The sinners have to turn from evil. The backsliders have to turn from evil. The careless believers who are neglecting their salvation, the careless believers who live from day to day, and they never think of salvation. They think hey, that salvation is already there, and that salvation is secured, and whatever I do, they just live their lives carelessly. They barely can have correct time. They barely can have personal reading of the Bible, apart from what they hear in church when they're able to come. But it says, if that person or that nation, it gives them a pronounce, will turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I sought to do unto them. Look at verse 9, and at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation, or concerning a kingdom, or concerning a family, or concerning an individual, concerning a kingdom to build up and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, if it takes my grace for license, if it takes my promise for license, if it takes my goodness for license, if it takes my mercy for license, at that instant, at Spokane, I'll build it up, I'll plant it. If it do evil in my sight, not in the sight of man, men may say, that's all right. You're doing well. You have always been doing well. And you know there are people, uh, they say, uh, my brother, I, I, need you, I need your word here. What do you think about my life? Uh, you, you know me, and uh, you know how I, how I deal, and you know the things, the places I go. Uh, uh, give me honest, honest evaluation of what you think about me. And the other fellow, he doesn't want to offend you. He knows your character, and he knows your disposition. He says, well, from all I can see, I think you're all right. Tell me, tell me the truth. I always like the truth. I'm telling you what I see, what I see. I don't know what I cannot see, but the one I see, I think you're all right. They might say you're all right. You might even think you're all right. If they do evil in my sight, it's the Lord who evaluates our lives. If they do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent, I will reverse the good I said I will do, wherewith I said I will benefit them. You see, that, that, that's the way of the Lord. That's a good way of the Lord. Is it on Ezekiel? Ezekiel chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 29. Ezekiel chapter 18. I'm reading here from verse 29. Yet, says the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal, O house of Israel, and not my ways equal, and not your ways unequal. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, house of Israel, his beloved, house of Israel, the chosen ones, house of Israel, the peculiar treasure of the Lord. I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways. And the Lord said, says the Lord, says the Lord God, repent and turn yourselves. That's the way of the Lord. And that's the good will of the Lord. If we're going to have the future escape from the judgment of God, it says, repent, turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the days of him that dieth, says the Lord God, wherefore turn yourselves and live. It's so clear in the word of God what the way is. And we're looking at Hosea, Hosea chapter 10, I'm going to read verse 13, then I'll back up to verse 12. Hosea chapter 10, verse 13 first, it says, Ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thy way, in the multitude of thy mighty men. The people who surround themselves with mighty men like a shield, protecting them. Go ahead, do what you want to do. We're here. We'll protect you. 
everything is secured. But you know, the judgment of God was still come. And those people that encourage uh, others to go out and commit crime, go out and do this and do that, and you know, the other people are sitting at home and they're saying, go ahead and do it. We're in control. We're in charge of society. We're in charge of this place. Whatever you do, if they get you to the police station, just give me a call. In a minute, I talk to them. They're going to release you. But you know, God is not going to look at that and just say, that's all right. It's a man of power. It's a man of authority. And they're supporting this man, supporting this woman. Judgment will come. You didn't believe that one. I said, judgment will come. What's the way of escape? Look at verse 12. Sow to yourself in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. If your heart is ardent in sin, break up your fallow ground. And then it is time to seek the Lord until he come and rain righteousness upon you. I pray to be fulfilled in our lives. Come on to the New Testament now. We're coming to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 14. Mark chapter 12. We're looking at uh, verse 14. In Mark chapter 12, verse 14, it says, And when they were come, they say unto him, unto Christ, Master, we know that thou art true. Although they didn't mean what they said, but you know that's true. Christ is a true one, is a faithful one, transparently trustworthy, and cares for no man. Although they had their own intention for saying what they were saying, but that's true. That's true about Christ. Cared for no man. He was no respecter of persons. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Teaches the way of God in truth. It's the one that reveals the way to us. And reveals the way without looking at the personality of anyone. Here's their question. Is it lawful to give a tribute to Caesar or not? Come to verse 17. Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And to God, the things that are God's. What does that mean? Your time, your place of work, all right? Render that to your Caesar. And your responsibility in your community, render that to your Caesar. And all the things you are supposed to do in your community, in your area, uh, social things, physical things, uh, personal things, so whatever it is, how to contribute to that community, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but unto God the things that are God's. What's that? Your heart. He created you. And he says, my son, give me your heart, your will, that you come to this earth to fulfill the will of God. You're not surrendering your heart to Caesar. You're not surrendering your will to Caesar. Your willingness to obey God and to please God in all things. Because that is what he has called you to do. That every moment you'll not please yourself. Every moment you'll not please society. Every moment you'll not please anyone. Every moment you'll not please Satan. You are here on earth to please the heavenly father. Render down to him the glory due to his name. The deal that he has. Render down to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And to God the things that are God. Your love. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, your worship, your devotion, your service, that you give yourself unreservedly unto God. Render to God the things that are God's. That's the way, and that's what He has ordained. And I pray that this new and living way you will follow, I will follow, we shall follow in Jesus' name. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the, into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. 
We need to enter to the only place. We need to enter into the holiest because the place we're going is a holy heaven. And there's a holy God there and the holy son Jesus Christ and the holy ghost and the holy angels and the holy saints that have gone before us. Everything there is holy. And for us to get there, we must enter into the holiest by a new and living way. By a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say, his flesh and having an high priest. Over, uh, and high priest over the house of God, let us draw near, this is the way, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. A conscience must not be kind of uncertain or evil or trained to do evil and the conscience cannot uh, cannot challenge us we have our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promise you hold on and you hold through in jesus name hebrews chapter 3 in Hebrews chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 10. It tells us in verse 10, Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation. He chose them. I was grieved with that generation. He delivered them. I was grieved with that generation. He sent a leader to them. He sent Moses to them to bring them out. And yet, I was grieved with that generation. And said, they do always err in my in their heart in their heart they always go astray their thoughts their mind their decisions their aspirations their ambitions and the lost of their heart they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways so i swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my race was the conclusion for that was the admonition because of looking at the other generation Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Tell me, tell me please out aloud. I don't know whether you read, you know, all these uh, books, they sell by the roadside there, or they sell in the market, or they sell in uh, those uh, books. They say there's a Christian bookshop. And everything you hear there, everything you see there, you go to buy the book. And as you are reading here, it says, uh, you know, I'm going to show you the way of the Lord. And this way of the Lord is nothing like this. After you come to know the Lord, you know the Lord, final. You know the Lord, that's full. You know the Lord, that's forever. You can never, they, say, they will repeat it. I repeat it again, and then they put it in italics or they put it in capital letters. Once you have come in, you cannot depart. That's not true. That's not true. That's not true. That's not the way. Look at the way here. Take it, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You came in by your decision. You can go out by your own volition. But you must make up your mind. I have come in. I will stay. I said I will stay. Look at verse 13. But exhort one another daily. While it is called today. Lest any of you be hiding through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if, that's the condition there, we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the very end. I believe and I pray, not just hoping, I pray the journey you have started, you will not stop halfway in Jesus' name. I will see you on the final point of victory. I will see you at the time when you enter into that gate and then you look at me, I look at you, I will say, brother, sister, we have escaped the final judgment. You will escape. 
I said you will escape. Point number three now. The incorruptible gospel way for full escape. A full escape. You escape from the clutches of Satan. You escape from the control of evil spirits. You escape from the corruption of sin. You escape from all the crimes of society. You escape from the condemnation that is going to come on sinners in the final day. Praise the Lord, you will escape. The incorruptible gospel way for a full escape. Look at the gospel. We're looking at uh, Romans chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 15. Romans chapter 1. We're reading from verse 15. In Romans chapter 1 verse 15. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Why? Because it's a gospel way that will make people escape, full, fully escape the judgment that is coming here on earth and there in eternity. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is reaching. The just shall live by faith. You will live by faith. First Corinthians, first Corinthians. I'm looking at chapter 15. First Corinthians, chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 1, the gospel. First Corinthians, chapter 15. We're reading from verse 1. Incorruptible gospel way for a full escape. What's that gospel? Chapter 15, first Corinthians, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein ye stand. Have you seen the gospel there? I preached it, you received it, and you stand in it. Not that you receive it and then you walk away. You heard it, you received it, and you stand in it. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory. If ye keep in memory. If ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye are believed in vain. For I delivered unto you this the gospel, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. The gospel is not that you are turning over a new leaf. The gospel is not that I'm making a resolution. The gospel, I will make my life better. The gospel, I will save myself. No. It's because of what Christ has done and you plunge yourself into that which Christ has done. He died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He did that for you. I said he did that for you. And if you are the only one that believes that on earth, you will get to heaven. First Thessalonians chapter 1, I read from verse 5. The gospel way, the gospel way that gives us total escape, Complete escape, the full escape. In First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, for our gospel came not unto you in what only, but also in power. Gospel coming in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as she know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. For you became followers of us. You have the gospel, you received it. You believed it, you dropped the way you had before, the opinions you had before, the traditions you had before, and now you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, 
but also in every place your faith to God watch is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we urge unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's the effect of the gospel. Those are the people that escape. They heard about the true God and they heard about the living God. They forsook the false gods of the heathen and they forsook the dead gods of the pagans and now they turned to the true and living God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Because they believed, they were delivered from the wrath to come. And I pray the wrath to come will not be part of your life anymore. We're looking at 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For the time is come. The judgment must be begin at the house of God. Why? Judgment to begin at the house of God. I thought the preachers are telling us that once you give your life to Christ, did you raise up your hand the other time on the crusade field and then you said yes, or they say all your sins have been judged. No judgment again. No examination again. No evaluation again. And then, are you coming to the house of God? Yes, I do come. Uh-huh. All your sins have been judged on Christ. Whatever you do now, wherever you go now, whatever you smoke now, whatever you drink now, how many women you get in touch with apart from your wife, all that doesn't matter anymore because everything has been judged on Christ. Let's leave all these uh, people that are aberrant and erroneous in their ways. Let's look at the watch of God. Look at that verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Look at this. And if it first begin at us, at us, Servants of God, saints of God, believers, ministers, if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Look at that word, obey, obey the gospel of God. Believe, believe, believe only. They say, all we need to do with the gospel is just to believe the gospel. Uh -uh, we believe the gospel, we obey the gospel. There's a part of the gospel that demands obedience, the commandments of God in the gospel, and the six, the prescription of the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel. We believe the grace of God in the, in the gospel. We also obey the word of God and the command of God in the gospel. It says, if it's first begin at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous castly be saved, where shall the ungodly sinner appear? I pray you will not remain ungodly. You will not remain unrighteous. And this gospel will keep on working effectively in your life, in my life, in our lives together in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of us should seem to come short of it. It says, as we read the totality of the word of God, and we see the demands, uncompromising demands of God. It says, let us fear, not slavish fear, reverential fear. His God, we honor him, we exalt him, we fear him. Lest any of us come short 
of it. Verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. It says, hearing it is one thing, allowing it to come into you, you chew it, you think over it, you digest it, you assimilate it, and you allow it to mix your face in your heart. And your heart says, I believe every word of it. If it does not do that, then we come short. For we which are believed do enter into rest. He said, As I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Verse 11, let us labor, therefore, let us endeavor, therefore, let us commit ourselves, therefore, let us give in to the gospel, therefore, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that trust, lest any man fall after the same manner of unbelief. I will not fall. Verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest, which is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast. How do we hold our profession? I said, how do we hold our conviction? How do we hold the doctrines of the word of God? Let us hold fast a profession. For we have not an high priest which shall not be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come how boldly. Today is not the day of judgment. The mercy of God is available for us. The love of God is still calling us. And the warnings of God are coming so that we can come and receive all the grace we need to be everything we ought to be. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find help in the time of need. Whatever you need tonight of the grace of God, of the mercy of God, of the love of God, of the forgiveness of God, of the goodness of God, it will flow into your way, into your heart, into your life in Jesus' name. It will strengthen you. It will make you strong. And the ability and the faith to hold fast unto the very end, it will give unto you in Jesus' name. All who believed in the past and all who have gone to heaven now, they didn't get there by their own strength. They didn't get there by their own trying, trying and trying and struggling. They got there by the grace of God and God is no respecter of persons. That grace is available for you. And he says, my grace is sufficient for you. What are you? My grace is sufficient for you. What's the temptation? What's the trial? What's the thought? Wanting to make you turn back? Uh-uh, you will not turn back. He has called you and you have responded. You'll move on to the very end in Jesus' name. And then you go to tell all those in the house fellowship and go to assure all those people that you are going to see, that you are going to confront, that the grace of God is available for everyone. There's grace for every sinner. There's grace for every saint. There's grace for every servant. There's grace for every soldier. And there is grace for every steward. And there is grace for every servant of God. And for every one of us here tonight, abundant grace waiting for you. And once you say, Lord, I am here, see what I'm going through, it will get you out of that difficulty and you will be rejoicing knowing it makes us stronger and stronger every day in Jesus' name. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Let us come, let us come, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It will help you call, cry unto the Lord and the Lord will give you all the grace you need. You will not fail, you will not fall, you will not falter in Jesus' name.